Why is she headed for Oberilien? There is a line of towns along the Imperial Highway leading to Enns. Because green dragons are convoluted in their thinking. She's probably thinking something silly like how Enns is the closest, most obvious target so there's probably some trap waiting for her there. So she's going to East Estate because Enns might contain a trap. She can take her time with the three cities on the Golden Strand because they have a longer evacuation route. Maximum damage with minimum risk. Is there anything we can do to force her from her course? Attempting to force her to do anything will inform her of the difference in power between us. As Ilishnish pointed out, their main advantage was the idea that they had hurt her before. Both Ludmilla and Ilishnish had a ring of non-detection equipped, which prevented their opponent from discerning their strength using direct methods. Deriving conclusions from mundane observations, such as how many warriors gauge their opponents by observing movements, crossing blades and assessing techniques, was still very much possible. If they made consistently weak attacks, the illusion that they were a significant threat would crumble and shatter. They were rapidly approaching the limits of their deception. The lights of East Estate appeared in the distance as they descended along the slopes of the southern ranges. Ludmilla retrieved a longbow from her infinite haversack. How will that help? I'm not sure if it will, but we have to dissuade her somehow. The strength and severity of a ranged attack are highly dependent on equipment, so direct assessments of strength won't be so straightforward. Do you have anything that can hurt her? Yes. At least I think they should. Alchemical arrows only have to hit, they don't have to penetrate to deliver their content. Ludmilla reached into her pouch again, wondering how she could present herself as an unignorable threat. Green dragons were immune to acid, holy water would be just as useless and the scales of an ancient dragon required highly enchanted arrowheads to penetrate, ruling out roughly half of her inventory. She took two high-volume glass arrows filled with alchemists' fire between her fingers. How close can we get? If she's preoccupied, we can probably land right on top of her like we did the other day. If not, a hundred meters, maybe? The Viridian Dragon continued picking up speed as they closed in on the city. Ilishnish adjusted to follow. Will you be able to keep up with her? At this angle, easily. In a sheer dive, she can end up faster, actually. What does this saddle do? I'm not sure, Lord Kokitus didn't say anything about it. Since it's a saddle, shouldn't it have a related enchantment? I don't feel anything different, I guess we'll find out when we find out. We'll be over East Estate in about 15 minutes at this rate, have you figured anything out? As long as you can keep up, we can wait until we're closer to the city. There are a dozen Death Cavaliers patrolling around the walls that I can call into the fight. How will that be useful in any way? If she can sense how strong they are, she might associate them with the Death Series servitors used in the ambush. She'll be wary of getting too close to the ground if they're waiting for her. After that, it was the left wing that we injured, yes? That's right. You can see how sensitive she is to her injuries still. Ludmilla examined the Dragon Lord ahead of them, unable to discern what Elishnish had pointed out. Even with all of their preparations and the extended battle, they had only managed to bring her health down by a fifth before she had withdrawn. Her life essence currently showed that she had recovered half of that. There was a clear discrepancy between the absolute condition of their target and how injured she still felt. Either fear of injury or delayed recovery was limiting her movements or the working condition of a living being's body was not accurately represented by the health indicated by life essence. Either way, it was something that they could exploit. I'll focus on attacking the same wing we damaged before. It will be good if we can slow her down, but stoking her fears and putting her on the defensive should be fine. I can appreciate the struggles of my prey, but you just enjoy tormenting everyone, don't you? Ludmilla frowned at the thought. I can't say that I enjoy it, but, now that I think about it, my constant focus on problems and weaknesses might be interpreted as that. They closed within five minutes of East Estate. Ludmilla issued a warning to the city garrison before calling out for the Death Cavaliers. The peal of bells washed over them as distant figures on the walls ran back and forth. Any distraction is better than none, I suppose. That wasn't my intent, but how much closer do you think you can get? Fifty meters. It depends on how preoccupied she is with her attack, oh, she's leveling out and slowing down. Ludmilla was pressed down slightly into her saddle as Ilishnish adjusted her course. Did she notice us? No. 
she's probably planning to make some sort of megalomaniacal statement before attacking them. Fools. You worms dare turn against me? See? Let's sneak closer. Late as it was, the streets of East Estate were mostly empty. The windows of the wealthy lit up at the sound of the alarm. Faint screams started to rise from below as the Viridian Dragon Lord's voice boomed over the city. I have graciously allowed your existence in my domain for a mere pittance, but you have repaid my benevolence with short-sighted treachery. The passing of generations has filled you with empty pride. Now, you shall choke on it. The Dragon Lord banked over the far wall and headed back towards the city center. Ludmilla stood in her stirrups, leaning forward as she drew her longbow against the massive green dragon below. Earlier in the day, as she watched the Imperial Air Service perform reconnaissance for the army and mark out targets, Ludmilla realized that she did have something that would simplify aerial archery. She waited for her target to straighten her course again. No fear and tremble in despair. Curse your mindless greed as you gasp out your last. A draconic shriek echoed over East Estate as the middle of the Viridian Dragon Lord's left wing burst into flame. Ludmilla's second sounding shot shattered, splattering alchemists' fire over the leathery membrane, adding fuel to the blaze. The ancient green ascended, crossing right in front of them. Ilishnish released a stream of frozen breath into the base of the flaming wing. Ludmilla grabbed the pommel of her saddle and tightened her legs as the frost dragon dove away in the opposite direction. Hmm, it has occurred to me how bad other dragons might be at fighting. What do you mean? Ilishnish winged over the nearest wall dipping low to the ground as she banked to follow it. Cheers from the Imperial Knights manning the walls trailed in their wake. I wish they wouldn't do that. They're giving away my position. The cheers stopped as Ludmilla informed the city's defenders. Ilishnish swept around the fortifications along the river, rising from behind the garrison keep. Their draconic adversary circled warily over the city but seemed to have lost them. The Dragon Lord's head went back and forth in her search of her ambusher. Anyway she fights instinctively. Something happens and she reacts without thinking. Since green dragons are notorious schemers I thought there would be more to it than that, but it doesn't seem to be the case. When you startled her, her first reaction was to get to a presumably safer altitude. It was so predictable that I could precisely hit her wing with my breath. Frost dragons don't do the same thing? I think we all do when we're younger, that part can't be helped. Frost dragons are weak compared to most other dragon species, however, even as adults we have a larger number of competitors that we can't easily overpower through strength alone. Due to my bardic pursuits, the training under Master Tian and working for the Adventurer Guild, I would dare say that I've become a far more capable combatant than dragons who simply rely on raw power to achieve their goals. Ilishnish leveled out and banked towards the Viridian Dragon Lord. Though the ambush had thoroughly startled her, Ludmilla's life essence indicated that, despite their visually impressive attack, she had not taken any significant damage. Still. Does that mean you can beat her? Hardly. Power is power, after all. She's so powerful that I wouldn't stand a chance in a direct confrontation. We may be able to, as you say, pester her to death, however. If that was the case, they would first need to get her away from the vulnerable settlements lest the Dragon Lord lash out at them in a fit of rage. Ludmilla knocked a lightning arrow, leaning forward to line up another attack. They were twice the distance as before, but a hundred meters was still relatively close. As soon as the arrow left her bowstring, however, the Dragon Lord swerved. Ilishnish ascended as a snarl rose from below. What was that? Blind sight. You and I can conceal ourselves, but your arrow cannot. Now that she's looking out for attacks, it won't be so easy for you to land them. The Dragon Lord banked westward. Her flight speed had noticeably slowed, but it was still terribly fast. They had also probably reinforced her fear of crippling injuries, which was something to be thankful for. Ilishnish continued to shadow her and the Death Cavaliers followed their quarry from below. A trickle of worry coursed through Ludmilla as they rapidly closed on a village along the highway. She turned her attention to the undead cavalry. Make sure that the chain you're carrying is clearly visible, herd her away from the road if you can. The Death Cavaliers spread out, displaying the heavy chains of East Estate city gates between them. Ludmilla's weight shifted as Ilishnish mirrored the Dragon Lord's reaction, ascending slightly as their course settled over the churning waters of the River Eileen. It's beginning to frighten me how you can reliably manipulate your enemies like that. Well, 
luckily for us I've always been that way. As they sped high over the valley, Ludmilla occasionally sent an arrow toward their adversary. Her frustration rose as her attacks were continually evaded. Those arrows take just over a second to reach her. How can something so huge dodge so easily? I'm not sure why you'd question that. She's an ancient dragon. I think I know why Brunhild has martial arts that track her target now. She has what? Have you no pride? The Viridian Dragon Lord's voice rolled out into the night. To be in league with these puny undead. To have that thing riding upon you. No true Dragon Lord would submit themselves to such disparaging treatment. You're a Dragon Lord? I don't know why people have been calling me that recently. Below them, the ancient green scoffed. No answer? Well, I suppose it is not a slave's place to speak. Then I shall address your mistress. Who are you? A vampire lord? A shade? Corpus of the Abyss has no business being here. How do you know about Corpus of the Abyss? What, what are you doing? Just speaking with her is dangerous. Elishnish's worried thoughts were accompanied by a slight assent, putting more distance between herself and their opponent. It's an opportunity to gather information. She assumes that we're from Corpus of the Abyss because of all of the powerful undead accompanying us, but that organization is not actually something we know much about. What do you take me for? The Dragon Lord's sneer filled her voice. Do not mistake me for one of those teeming mortals who squirm in their puny hovels, ignorant of the world beyond. I know that you are far from where you should be, far from any of your centers of power in the frozen tundras of the south. Since you do not appear to have the strength to decisively confront me, I suggest that you leave and never return to my domain. There is nothing here for you but savage tribes and even more savage humans. As the Viridian Dragon Lord spoke, Ludmilla gauged her with her skill. Oily darkness filled her senses, a disgusting sensation that she could nearly taste, growing thicker with every sentence. Sickening revulsion beyond anything she had ever experienced filled her being. Whether or not she spoke truly, this green dragon would forever exist as a reviled foe of the Sorcerer King. I do not answer to dragon lords, Ludmilla told her. By his majesty's will, the chains that you have lashed upon these lands shall be broken. Ho, oh, so the little mistress has a master of her own? Who might his majesty be? His hallowed name is not fit for your vile tongue. Lively words for a talking corpse. The dragon vanished. Elishnish pitched forward into a dive. Her alarm flooded Ludmilla's mind. Invulnerable fortress. Her defensive art activated, but it wasn't enough to stop the attack. Massive claws slashed open her back, sweeping her off of her saddle in a spray of blood and the pungent odor of aqua regia. Mistress. Don't come after me. Fireball. As Ludmilla tumbled towards the trees below, a sphere of flame streaked through the air in front of Ilishnish. Fireball. The frost dragon maneuvered in a wild dance as the ancient green pursued her, unleashing spells along the way. After falling for a dozen seconds amidst torn pieces of her spine, ribs and organs, Ludmilla activated her frostburn phoenix hairpin, steadying herself and slowing her descent. She pulled a short bow out of her infinite haversack. I've leveled out beyond her blind sight range and I'm concealed. Are you alright? I told you just speaking with her is dangerous. She might have had something interesting to say, but she's been trying to figure out how to fight us at the same time. When she disappeared, she must have silently cast something like Dimension Move. Mages usually use it to get away, but she used it to get behind us. Another fireball hurtled across the night sky, followed by the searing lines of a scorching ray spell. I'm sure she silently cast some enchantments on herself while you were speaking, as well. This just got a lot harder, at least these fire spells she's using need to be aimed. Can you reverse your positions? I'm trying. She's slower than I am because of her injuries, but every time I evade one of her spells, I lose speed. She's aiming them purposefully so I can't do anything to outmaneuver her. Actually, shouldn't this fire resistance ring cover most of the damage? Keep dodging. Why? If you can stay ahead of her, keep dodging. She doesn't know you have fire resistance and, if you keep flying erratically, she can't predict where you'll be for another dimension move. It seems like her only option is to slow you down with spells. If we can run her out of mana, we won't have to worry about her magic. Ludmilla flew west after them, but the flight effect from her magic item was nowhere near close to the same speed as the two dragons. 
She sighed as she was forced to powerlessly watch her companion evade the attacks of the Dragon Lord. To her surprise, Ilishnish started to come back her way after a few minutes. What happened? She turned me around. I was hoping to drag her over to Thing Vela. That's, wait, what did you say? I was hoping to drag her over to the Frost Giants? These stupid green dragons and their stupid thinking. Whoa. The frost dragon dipped as another fireball streaked between her wings. Ludmilla looked around with a furrow on her brow. Further to the west, the icy peaks of the Azalizia Mountains loomed. Below was an expanse of forested foothills. Ilishnish, how high above the ground are you? Right now? About 6,000 meters. I've been trying to pull her head by gaining altitude, but she keeps forcing me back down. Drop to a thousand. Ilishnish folded her wings, entering into a spiraling dive towards the forests below. The Dragon Lord dove after her and Ludmilla descended as well. Less than two minutes later, the Frost Dragon and her pursuer leveled out again. Fly straight. Uh. A sphere of flame blossomed in the night sky as a fireball struck Ilishnish. Ow. Some of that got through. She's faster than me after that dive, too. Hi ee. -e. Why are her teeth so big? Did I sacrifice all of my altitude just so she could reach my tail? You are. She just went for it again. No, I had you come down because Lord Mayor once mentioned that Lady Aura's effective direct fire range is around two kilometers. A streak of light flashed out of the forests below, piercing through the Viridian Dragon Lord. The invader plummeted from the sky without a sound. How are you doing? As fine as a frost dragon could be after being hit by a fireball. I suppose. Despite Alishnish's grumbling, Ludmilla couldn't find any sign of injury on her companion. There were no chips, cracks or scorch marks over her body. It occurred to her that the frost dragon always maintained a perfect appearance regardless of whether she was a dragon, human or anything else. Her scales of bluish-white shimmered like polished moonstones while her teeth and claws were impeccably clean and unmarred. Even her wings always seemed to be arranged just right in whatever configuration they were in. The bards in the Adventurer Guild and those who entertained the citizens in both the Sorceress Kingdom and the Baharuth Empire did always endeavor to maintain an immaculate and eye-catching appearance, but Ludmilla had no idea how a ten-meter-long dragon could groom herself so meticulously. After Elishnish came over to pick Ludmilla back up, they backtracked along the Frost Dragon's flight path until they came across a line of broken trees. Elishnish circled the area twice before alighting in the freshly created clearing. At the end of the snapped trunks and crushed undergrowth was Lady Aura. Hey, hey. The dark elf ranger smiled brightly. Good evening, Lady Aura. Ludmilla couldn't help but smile in response to her energetic greeting. See you around, was it? Tae. Ilishnish looked over Ludmilla's shoulder. Where did the dragon lord go? The frost dragon asked. Over there, Lady Aura jerked a thumb over her shoulder. Ludmilla leaned to the side and Ilishnish stretched her neck high as they looked behind Lady Aura. Arranged neatly behind her were a variety of dragon-derived goods. Th that's not a dragon, Ilishnish said. It's a skin dragon, Lady Aura replied. Hi ee -e. Ilishnish ducked behind Ludmilla. She scrunched herself up to reduce her profile, folding her wings tightly against her back. That's a bit beyond skinned, Ludmilla noted. Huh? What are you talking about? When you skin something, you get materials, it's common sense. It's barely been five minutes. I got it all done four minutes ago, Lady Yora puffed out her chest proudly. Ludmilla eyed the bones, meat, organs, claws and teeth arranged over the space. Viridian scales piled as high as Lady Yora lay along a neatly folded hide. It took Ludmilla about four minutes to properly field dress a deer, which she thought was respectably quick. She couldn't imagine how anyone could so thoroughly dismantle a 28-meter-long ancient green dragon in less than one minute. Say, Lady Aura walked around Ludmilla as she looked up at Ilishnish, isn't she wearing? Ilishnish scuttled sideways, keeping Ludmilla between them. Her fearful eyes stayed fixed on the bloody knife in Lady Aura's hand. Dame Verilin, Ludmilla said, you're being rude. Rude? Ilishnish squeaked, if I drop my guard. I'll be turned into materials in a heartbeat. That leather armor she's wearing is dragon scale, you know, she has a red outfit and now she can make a green one. Who knows when she'll decide she wants a white one. Being on your guard doesn't matter, Lady Aura told her. 
I'd skin you all the same. Hi ee -e. Elishnish took on her human appearance and clung fearfully to Ludmilla from behind. Ludmilla frowned as her now scaleless companion pressed against her back. Why did she have to have such an outrageous body? Lady Shiltier was entirely right about insisting on the snow elf appearance. She's not going to skin you, Ludmilla said. Isn't that right, Lady Aura? Of course not. Lady Aura pulled out a handkerchief and started wiping her blade clean. You're one of Shiltier's. You don't see me running around skinning vampire brides, do you? The dark elf ranger raised the blood-soaked cloth and narrowed an eye at it, sticking out her lower lip. Ludmilla reached into her infinite haversack, producing a trooper's towel. Would you like one of these, my lady? Was it? A magic item that I purchased recently. It can be used to cast a clean spell three times per day. Lady Aura took the trooper's towel in hand. She frowned in concentration for a moment before its magic washed over her, leaving everything in her possession spotless. Ooh, I don't have anything like this. Is it really okay to have it? They're quite convenient, so I bought several sets of them. Ludmilla pulled out more of the magic items. Please take these for your household. Make sure Lord Mayor carries a few as well. We get quite dirty doing things together in Warden's Vale and I'm sure he ends up that way wherever he goes. One by one, the towels disappeared into Lady Aura's inventory. The young dark elf pursed her lips with a thoughtful look, then turned around to pick something up. Here, she held out a two-meter-long dragon horn. Maybe you can turn this into something. You need to upgrade that bow especially, it's not powerful enough to land accurate attacks at a distance. I, thank you, my lady. Ludmilla received the incalculably valuable material in her hands. I'll see what can be done about that. Out of curiosity, have you been waiting here all this time? Not here here, but I've been around. Demiurge said that something like this would be the most likely outcome, but I was wondering when you'd catch on. That dummy said you might become all stubborn again and get eaten. Wait, Ilishnish poked her head over Ludmilla's shoulder, so you knew this would happen even before we started fighting? Not until recently, Ludmilla replied. But I had a hunch. Lord Kokitus cheated a bit, I think. The saddle that came with the Solita was a big hint. Un. Lady Aura grinned. Hunches are the best, it works because it does. Just follow your feelings, you can think about what you did later. That makes sense, Ilishnish agreed. Thinking makes you dumb. It did, to a degree. One could overthink themselves to their doom, just as the Viridian Dragon Lord had. Imperial society was mired by convoluted and harmful machinations, as well. Analyzing things after the fact was all well and good, but, as Lady Shiltier and Lady Aura noted, trusting her intuition more often than not resulted in favorable outcomes. Ludmilla had invested the vast majority of her time learning about the Empire and experiencing what it was like. This enabled her to act with surprising effectiveness as she felt her way through her duties. With this being the case, what she required was the expertise to ensure that her intuition led her in the right direction. Ah anyway, Lady Aura said. You still have a job to do. Those humans are probably panicking like crazy right now. Yes, my lady. Also. Yes, my lady. Her wearing that saddle as a human makes you two look like perverts. A null arrow thunked into the fallen log by Rango Bart's head. The spray of splinters it sent into the air was stopped by his protection from Arrow's spell, but he still ducked instinctively. How long are we stuck in this hole for? He muttered. For as long as we're ordered to, Commander Wren said. It's still pitch black out, anyway. As a measure against being spotted through the canopy, the soldiers of the Second Legion were prohibited from lighting fires and instructed to minimize any magical lighting. They were to entrench themselves, camouflage their positions and conserve their fighting strength until conditions more amenable for human operations were available. Rangobot agreed that it was a prudent course of action, but it didn't make being attacked in the dark feel any better. Despite heading for cover in an orderly fashion when the Viridian Dragon Lord's appearance had been reported, chaos broke loose when the entire army group was hit by dragon fear. Thousands of men were turned into a screaming, fleeing mass in a single flyover by the Viridian Terror. How could anyone fight such a ridiculous adversary? After things had settled down, Rangobot found himself in a trench excavated under a fallen tree by a transmuter from the Engineer Corps. 
Five dozen men from a jumble of units joined them over the next few minutes, most notably Commander Enns. Aside from the engineer, Rangobart was the only other wizard present. There was also a cleric from the 1st Division's 1st Company, who spent most of his time staring across the trench at the death priest who had hopped in with them sometime during the initial commotion. Not long after that, they found that the demi-human tribes had taken advantage of the situation to move into the area. Now, they were laying siege to their positions. Fortunately, most of the scattered groups had a commander or captain with them, so communicating back and forth between their hiding places provided a measure of collective assurance and awareness. Unfortunately, it had started to rain, turning their positions into waterlogged holes. How are we for mana? Commander Enz asked. The death priest gave the commander a thumbs up. The cleric sighed and nodded. Let's see if we can find whoever sent that arrow over. Four wraiths appeared before them, followed by an archangel flame. Several of the men shook their heads wordlessly at the sight. War made for some ridiculous tales. The archangel flame flew out of the trench first, wreathed in radiant light. Rather than searching for something to attack, it was sent weaving around over the undergrowth. Arrows flew up to greet it, most of them incapable of penetrating the angel's damage reduction. One of them stuck. The commander nodded. Go. Hugging the jungle floor, the four wraiths soundlessly disappeared into the night. Startled yips sounded in the air. A few minutes later, the sounds of nearby fighting diminished. The cleric and the death priest sat down again. How many did we get? Someone asked. The death priest held up three fingers. Heads nodded around the trench. At first, they had tried using the Death Series servitors to clear away the demi-humans suppressing their positions. The idea fell flat on its face for reasons similar to why the Death Knights and Death Warriors couldn't just be sent to rampage all around the blister without support. They were too slow in the jungle terrain and they couldn't detect the gnolls hiding everywhere. To make things worse, the range of dark vision was limited and only scouts with natural dark vision enjoyed any advantage. That meant the gnolls, despite their relative weakness, outclassed the Death Series servitors in their current environment. After all of the zombies that they had accumulated were destroyed and two Death Knights came back looking like giant hedgehogs made out of null arrows, the general called off any further attempts to forcefully clear away their demi-human opponents. Thirty minutes after that, someone reported limited success using summons. Some retaliation was better than sitting around impotently with arrows landing all around them, so a strange battle had since ensued between the demi-human forces and the Imperial Army's expendable conjured attackers. Rangobat made a note to himself about learning a few conjuration school spells just in case he ever found himself in a similar situation. Assuming he survived. As a new war wizard, his training so far focused on the essentials, defensive enchantments, crowd control and damaging spells of different energy types to be used as the situation demanded. That being said, he only had the barest of the basics so far and it would take him years to learn all of the spells required of a company war wizard. He turned his head up to stare wearily at the canopy. Was the sky getting lighter? Checking his watch for probably the eighth time since holding up, he found it to be three and a half hours past midnight. Just over three hours after the Dragon Lord had emerged from her lair. When the dragon unexpectedly left without laying waste to the second legion, the air wing had flown off in pursuit. As Wing Commander Burke had noted at the first meeting in Enns, however, she was far faster than they were. The last report had her disappearing to the southwest. There was no sign of Lady Zaradnik or her frost dragon and mana spent keeping track of a fight that they couldn't influence was mana that couldn't be used in their own battle. The man to his right yawned. To his left, Commander Enns stirred. Get ready to move, he told them. We have orders, sir? Rangobart asked. Yeah, the commander nodded. Increase the lighting. Get some fires going, I'm sick of standing in a puddle. All across the trench, the men moved. Most looked glad to be doing something other than sitting miserably in the rain. As the space lit up, Commander N seemed to engage in some silent conversation. His hands made the accompanying gestures, boots squishing in the mud as he paced back and forth. The men huddled around the fires as the minutes passed. At long last, the commander broke his silence. It's done. It's done, you mean the dragon's gone? Yeah, she went down somewhere around East Estate. Faces brightened and excited chat arose. The commander held up his hand for silence. 
First things first. There are two captains, about a hundred soldiers, and a death knight hold up around 200 meters to the west. We've been slowly picking off the strongest demis around us with summons, so coming out of our holes to form up shouldn't be too bad. How many shields we got? One of the sergeants asked. About two squads worth between us. We'll be pretty thin at the start, but the death knight and our death priest here will be pushing ahead. They probably won't catch much with how these knolls are, but they should buy plenty of time for us to get organized and pick up more men. They gathered up their loose things and made ready below the lip of the trench. Sounds of distant fighting filtered through the trees. One more set of summons, the commander said. Have them fan out ahead of us. The death priest and the death knight on the other side will come out after that, then the heavy infantry will move to cover the way out. Keep your heads down until we've reorganized ourselves. Rangobat refreshed his defensive enchantments as the fresh summons went over the top. Rustling and the sound of knolls being disturbed in the undergrowth came from nearby. The death priest hopped out of the trench, extending its wicked flail. Mass inflict wounds. Piercing shrieks issued from the unseen demi-humans. The heavy infantry came out with shields raised, covering the top of the ramp leading out of the trench. An arrow bounced off one of the men's pauldrons. Knolls on the flank. Commander ends called from below, the fronts tied up, cover our rear. The spearmen hefted their shields and repositioned themselves. Rangobot scrambled out as the trench emptied of soldiers, his body bent low over the ground. Ahead, he could see where the men were forming up. From behind the small shield wall, rangers were already exchanging arrows with knolls in the rear that Rangobard couldn't see. We're all here. Advance northwest 300 meters, we have another group holed up there. Light up these trees. A nearby ranger pulled a flight arrow from his quiver, holding it out towards him. Rangobat reached into one of his belt pouches for a pinch of ruby dust. Continual light. Rangobat squinted as the arrow flared brightly. The ranger loosed it up into a nearby trunk. More enchanted arrows from different rangers planted themselves high under the trees along the way, effectively eliminating the Knoll's night advantage. Soldiers streamed out from their hiding places to join the advancing formation as they came close. Their ranks grew as they picked up the disparate groups in the area. With their growing ranks came a sense of stability as the Knoll's harassment grew increasingly ineffective. Another large group with a death knight and two death warriors eventually joined them. The commander stopped as they reordered their formations. Still kicking, Raburbad? A voice came from over his shoulder. Clean, too. He turned to find Captain German grinning at him, face and armor smeared with mud. Several of the 5th Company's sergeants were with the captain, barking out orders as they sorted out their makeshift squads. We had an engineer with us, sir, Rango Bard replied. Must have been nice. We had to hide between the roots of a tree. Demis tried to drive us from our position four or five times. An arrow stopped a few centimeters in front of Rango Bard's face. He blinked as it fell to the mud. Damn things are getting too smart. Harlow spat as he raised his shield in the direction of the hidden sniper. They're aiming for the wizards now. It's hard to tell the clerics apart from the heavy infantry, but your dresses stick out like nothing else. Ran into an all using martial arts and that fancy magic didn't do jack shit for the mage with us. Rango Bar tied the huge arrow on the ground as he edged closer to the infantry ranks. Another arrow flew in from the darkness, glancing off of Captain German's vambrace. Things are better now, the captain said, but this is still chaos. There must be a knoll behind every third tree. What are our orders, Commander? We're going to advance on the hill with the others, Commander Renz said. The general wants our encampment back. We need to recuperate and figure out what our next move is now that the Dragon Lord is gone. Within five minutes, they advanced north towards the distant lights of their abandoned camp. Curiously, they didn't encounter any resistance at all. When they approached the perimeter of the camp, it became clear why that was. What in the bloody hell? Harla breathed. Rangobot squeezed his eyes open and shut several times. Dead knolls were strewn everywhere, creating a grisly scene over the hillside. Rivulets of blood trickled down the trail leading through the rows of tents. Was it the Death Warriors? Rangobat frowned. Our Death Warriors are still with us, the commander said, and it looks like we're the first ones here. Along the base of the hill, he could see other groups of Imperial Knights similarly coming to a confused stop. 
The scenery changed little as they scaled the trail. Demi-human corpses littered the lanes and spaces between the tents. Considering the lack of carnage characteristic of death warriors and the fact that no zombies indicating the work of death knights were present, Rango Bart was at a loss as to what had happened. Most had simply been sliced or stabbed with unsettling precision. Near the headquarters on the highest ridge of the hill, they found the first sign of life. Frowning into her tent with hands on her hips was Baroness Saradnik. The frown vanished and the silver trim of her pure white armor gleamed as she turned to face them. Good evening, Commander Enns. Good evening, Lady Zaradnik, do you know what happened here? When I returned, she replied, I found gnolls all over the camp. So these dead gnolls, you did this? As you've already demonstrated the ability to take this hill with the Death Series servitors, I thought it better to make sure that they didn't run off with your supplies. You have my apologies if I overstepped myself. Rangobot turned in place, eyeing the dead demi-humans lying everywhere. If the entire hill was like this, then the Baroness had slain hundreds, if not thousands of them. I still can't figure out where some of my things went, Lady Zaradnik muttered. Please inform General Carbane that I've returned in case he needs me for anything, I'll be working on some reports in my tent. The world could be a harsh place, but it at least made sense most of the time. Now was not one of those times. Now. Erwith sniffed at the air, sensitive for any signs of pursuit. While the invaders were slow, there were many and her people were inevitably being driven into a corner. Her spotted fur went flat as bitterness filled her. Why was it that humans and undead could fight together while the tribes whose survival depended on defending their jungle could not? Even with the threat bearing down on their homes, threatening them with annihilation, she couldn't bring the races together to drive out the invaders. The trolls and ogres were confident in their strength and resilience, content to let the invaders come to them. The troglodytes couldn't understand what was going on. The dragons were too suspicious of everything and wouldn't allow those under their control to band together with anyone else, even news that their siblings were being slaughtered was some convoluted ruse in their minds. All that she had managed to gather were the Nol tribes and the goblins running amok in the chaos. After the first day of organized fighting, she felt confident that the situation would quickly become untenable for the humans. Though the reasons were unknown, the fact that the powerful undead appeared to be tied to them in some way was encouraging. If the humans left, then the undead might leave, as well. When the humans next advanced, they did so as a massive horde that focused on crushing all of the tribes and dragons that had stubbornly refused to band together to repel them. Erwith felt no satisfaction in witnessing their demise, only a sense of waste. In a situation where all were in peril, the loss of fighting strength would exact its toll on all who remained. Things started looking up when the Viridian Dragon Lord finally appeared and scattered the humans into the jungle. She wasn't sure where the dragon had disappeared to afterwards, but Herwith took advantage of the opportunity to hasten the humans' retreat. Several hours later, however, the fortunes of war were reversed again. All at once, the humans and undead came out from their holes and reorganized themselves. It didn't take long for Erwith to realize why. A human lord had fallen upon the hill camp that they had once occupied, a female far more powerful than the male human lords who had been leading their tribes through the jungle. Initially, Erwith didn't know what they were dealing with for she appeared absent of strength. As far as they knew, human lords were not female like Nol Alphas. The Viridian Dragon Lord occasionally spoke of humans as ants, so maybe the female was something like a human matriarch or a human queen. Regardless of what she was, the human lord's power was made clear through her actions, her wrath, terrible to behold. Those who challenged her simply died. Arrows could not reach her so a confusing melee ensued. She went up and down the hill like an enraged raptor who had discovered rats in her nest, leaving piles of dead gnolls in her wake. The terrain that hampered most of the humans did not impede her and she showed no signs of tiring. Belatedly, Erwith realized that the human lord was going after anyone visibly carrying the humans' things so Erwith told her people to drop them and flee. Those who stubbornly held onto them were hunted down. To their great relief, she did not give chase to the rest. For the next two days, the humans remained at the hill, cleaning up their camp, resting and fortifying their position. When they stirred again, they proceeded with a confidence suggesting that they no longer feared an attack from the Viridian Dragon Lord. Worries over the Dragon Lord's fate and what it meant plagued her with, but her worries did not help with what came. A long, bitter fight ensued and the Nulls' losses gradually took their toll. 
The undead were the main problem, despite their inability to catch the gnolls, their tireless nature wore their quarry down. Rest was impossible and exhaustion weighed heavily on everyone once the undead stopped adhering to the humans' habit of being active during the day. Human hunters took turns guiding them through the jungles in pursuit of their prey. How could they fight better? Was there anything they could do to improve their situation? Countless questions filled Erwith's weary mind. The answer, of course, was that the world was never so kind. Whatever was, was. Wishing and wanting changed nothing. The powerless were at the mercy of those with power. Those who had no one to rely on could only struggle to survive. Without the strength of the Viridian Dragon Lord, they would be ground to dust by their evil adversaries. She wasn't even sure if they could flee. The humans' territories surrounded them and there were likely more undead waiting. No, even a chance was better than nothing. Erwith went to inform the other leaders of her decision. She caught a whiff of something unfamiliar and her head snapped to the side. Standing not ten meters away was a strange-smelling knoll with a nick on her right ear and a scar running down her cheek. Erwith snarled at the unexpected intruder, knocking an arrow to her bowstring. Greetings, sister, the stranger said. I mean you no harm. Hackles raised, Erwith narrowed her eyes. Her ears swiveled about, keen for signs of further intrusion. My sisters are all dead, she said. Even if the dead could return to life, you cannot claim to be one of them. We are not of the same litter, the strange Noll agreed. Nor are we of the same pack or even the same forest. But we are both Nolls and, beyond that, there is something else that we share, an enemy. The Empire? Not the Empire, but their masters. The same masters who brought the undead that are destroying the balance. The Sorceress Kingdom. A low, vehement growl filled the air at the last. It was a name she had never heard before. If the Sorceress Kingdom was where the powerful undead had come from, however, it was surely a desolate wasteland filled with evil and suffering. A kingdom of darkness. War comes, sister, the stranger said. A war that will make the one you waged for your home seem like play fighting between pups. A war for our world. The Sorceress Kingdom has only recently revealed itself only begun to cast its evil shadow. Other evils rise alongside it and in those shadows team all the horrors that will be visited against what is good and right. We still have time to prepare, we must prepare. As one who has seen the ruin that they bring, you understand this, yes? Understanding is nothing, Erwith snorted. Knowledge is nothing. There is nothing we can do, nowhere we can know, how did you get here? Who are you? The strange Noll seemed to realize that she had not named herself. She nodded her head with her introduction. Zverith, she said. Zverith, matriarch of the Emberwood. I would have you join us, sister. What, what about my tribe? That goes without saying, Zverith's teeth flashed in the firelight as she grinned. For what is a Noll without her pack? Gather all that you can, gather the other races who will follow you. Tell them to come to the entrance to the dragon's lair overlooking the lake. I will wait for you there. With that, Zverith turned and disappeared into the undergrowth. Erwith stepped forward absently, eventually breaking into a run. She sprinted forward on all fours, silently making her way through the ferns and bushes. Could Zverith be believed? Erwith smelled no deceit. She also did not doubt that the stranger was a matriarch. Her strength was far beyond that of Erwith's old matriarch, perhaps exceeding the undead that were being sent against them. Erwith still did not know where Zvrith had come from or how she had come to their jungle, but the stranger appeared to understand the threat that faced them far better than she. She ran to the knolls harrying the humans' advance, ordering them to retreat to the meeting place. She sent runners to find all who could be found and convinced to join. For hours she ran and thousands of desperate families had gathered at the lake by the time she arrived at the dragon's lair. Zvrith was standing at the entrance, which was absent of its usual troglodytes. Her expression brightened at Erwith's approach. I spoke to the troglodytes, Zvrith said. It took a while, but they understand what is going on now, I think. They are simple and require patience, Erwith said. What did you have them do? I sent them down to the dragon's lair to gather her treasures. Why? Zvrith tilted her head at the question, turning her gaze towards the clouded night sky. You know it too, yes? The dragon lord will not return. She no longer needs her hoard, but we can still make great use of it. Come, Jem, I don't believe you've mentioned your name. Erwith. Erwith. Tell your people to come with us, Erwith. 
The way to safety lies below. Deep in the bowels of the Dragon Lord's lair, they came to the largest cavern with its steaming lake. Within was an island formed of treasure. Troglodytes teamed over it, snatching up gold and gems and other valuables to throw into fibrous sacks. Those who had filled theirs lined up to disappear into a hole hovering in the air. What is that? Erwith asked. Our way out, Zvrith answered. A magical portal that will take us to a place far from here. It is there we begin our preparations for what will come. Tell your people to do as these troglodytes do. Tell them to not be alarmed at what they see on the other side. There are many others there. This horde, this tribute that you and your ancestors helped to build, it will help you pay for what you need. Pay? Trade. One of many things you will learn. I was aware of this before, but there were still many other things that I was ignorant of. As your knowledge grows, you will come to understand the extent of the evil that has been visited upon us. The first gnolls approached cautiously, stopping at the edge of the water to sniff the air. A few dipped the pads of their feet into the water before wading over to pick up the sacks left for them on the ground to use. Gems and ores were sometimes bartered between tribes for various things, but most of their value lay in how they appeased the dragon lord. Come, Zvrith stepped forward. We should go on ahead. Our leader will be most pleased to see you. Leader? Are you not matriarch of the Ember Wood? I am, Zvrith's mottled fur rippled in acknowledgement. I lead the Null tribes, but there are many other races, yes? Whom I speak of is the one who has brought us together, a benefactor far more powerful than your dragon lord. The Null matriarch leapt over to the island and gestured for Erwith to follow. They went through the portal together and Erwith looked about in alarm as they entered unfamiliar surroundings. Her nose twitched and her ears swiveled at every sound. They had emerged in another wooded area near a cliff, but it was drastically different from the jungles of her home. There were more unfamiliar scents than familiar ones. The trees. It took a moment for Erwith to realize that the cliff beside them was a tree. A tree that was massive beyond compare, many times larger than the greatest trees she knew. Yet, it was not just a single tree, they were in a forest of them. Above them. Colossal platforms ringed the trunks. Broad wooden walkways spanned from platform to platform. Structures formed levels that rose into a canopy so high that clouds formed below it. What is this place? Erwith asked, where are we? Far to the southeast, Zvrith answered. Far from the evil of the sorcerous kingdom. We are in the sylvan realm of Arborea, where a thousand different races of the forest dwell. The place we build here will be a bastion of nature that stands tall against the plague of the undead and their depraved associates who have turned against life itself. Erwith followed Zverith. She watched a group of unfamiliar beastmen speak to the growing crowd of new arrivals as she and the matriarch walked by. Races that looked like nothing she had ever seen before walked every which way to unknown destinations. Some had paws, some had claws while others had hooves or walked about on roots like a null rauner. Horns, hair scales, and shells abounded. In the understory and the gargantuan boughs above, beings with wings of every sort traversed. There are so many here, Erwith said. Where will we stay? Surely the territory required for all these people is vast. Arborea is vast, Zvrith replied. It is the great forest of the south that spans the continent from coast to coast. Even in my time here, I cannot comprehend its entirety. Both of our old homes combined are but a speck in comparison. Zvarith led them to a wide walkway that spiraled its way up the nearest tree. They followed a line of beastmen with heads like wild boars who were carrying eggs taken from the dragon's lair in their arms. Your existence here will be vastly different from what you experienced in your old home, Zvarith told her. For evil has long taken root in that part of the world. Undead and humans who worship an undead god have constantly worked to destroy any tribes who dare to create something better for themselves. Here, the Dark Hand holds no influence. Here, we are free to build a future for our people. Be but where will we settle? Forgive me, Zvarith, but this is overwhelming. Be at ease, sister, Zvarith replied with a smile in her voice. As I have said, things work differently here. It is not like the places that you and I are from where all one can rely on our kith and kin. Trade flows between all places, so, for the time being, you may use the treasure from the dragon's hoard to sustain yourselves until your people mark out their new territory. They reached one of the platforms that Erwith had seen from below, which must have been a hundred meters above the forest floor. Through the gaps in the canopy, the skies were brightening to the east, many hours before the sun should have risen. 
Even without the hot springs and steaming lakes of her jungle home, it felt the height of summer. The overcast skies had been replaced by a field of unfamiliar stars. Before you send your people afield to find new homes, however, Zvarith said, it would be best to introduce yourself to our leader and convey your gratitude. Your leader is here? Erwith asked, not in his territory? Lords often dwell in their territories, but they are just as often here. The reasons are simple enough to understand once you experience life in Arborea. As for our leader, he, too, must dwell where all of the other leaders may easily find him, yes? After a short while, they rounded the massive trunk to approach a huge building carved out of its side. A long, winding walkway went up to end in a grand platform in front of an ornate door. He is within, Zvrith told her. Our leader is a being of great patience, wisdom and understanding, but show him no disrespect. Of course, Erwith Seer twitched in agreement. I would not dream of doing so. Beyond the door was a spacious room of some kind. With so many new things, Erwith grew uncomfortable with her lack of vocabulary. She could only think in terms of structures or dwellings or huts, but it all seemed woefully inadequate. Torches lined either wall and something like a hide had been laid out from the entrance, leading to a large seat that looked like it had been carved from a single block of basalt. Lounging upon that seat with one leg crossed over the other was a being that Erwith at first mistook for a tall male human with long red hair. Then she noted the two horns protruding from his temples and a pair of bat-like wings folded behind his back. A scythe as black as obsidian leaned against the side of his pleasantly dark seat. They came to stand before him and Zvrith lowered herself to a knee, bowing her head. A pair of eyes gazed out at them with a strange intensity that Erwith found difficult to describe as she followed the matriarch's lead. Was he blind? Or did he see things that she could not? A new sister has joined us in our struggle, Zvrith said, Lord Samael. 